Father, I pray tonight that you would help us to understand your word better. Lord, the title of this class is about misunderstanding your word, and we as uh, your people who need to hear from you want to understand what you have said to us rightly. So give us ears to hear uh, and eyes to see the wonderful truths of your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So in 1922, a very famous politician delivered a speech to uh, his people. And I want to read you a quote from it. He says this, my feeling as a Christian points me to my Lord and Savior as a fighter. In boundless love as a Christian and as a man, I read through the passage which tells us how the Lord at last rose in his might and seized the scourge to drive out of the temple the brood of vipers and adders. How terrific was his fight against the Jewish poison. Today, after 2,000 years with deepest emotion, I recognized more profoundly than ever before the fact that it was for this that he had, sh had to shed his blood upon the cross. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but I have the duty to be a fighter for truth and justice. Now, at face value, well, I don't know what happened here. Uh, at face value, this quote says that Jesus was a fighter for truth and justice, that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the sins of those buying and selling in the temple. And it's said with really poetic language. And so you might be thinking like, well, maybe this is from like one of those uh, super pious Puritans or uh, a modern day reformer. You know, it was during the world war times, someone who wants to stand up for what's right and live for God's glory. Do you know who this speech came from? Adolf Hitler. And Nazi Germany took the scriptures and twisted them for their own agenda and eventually rejected them as Jewish propaganda. But then, just shortly after that, about 50 years later, there was a group that was called the People's Temple, and they established what they called an agricultural project in Guyana. An American preacher took a group of Americans out into the jungle to found a colony that was safe from the influences of modern society. It was this growing little village of about a thousand people. Uh, this preacher was known for using Bible verses like John 14, 12, which says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. This preacher would claim that since he was a follower of Christ, he could work miracles and do these greater things on earth. And so uh, he said he was a guy that was worth following. He actually used this verse to justify to his followers, that he was greater than Jesus because he was doing greater works. He claimed that since he was doing greater works than Jesus, that he himself was divine. And then he would quote John 15, 13, that says, greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the members of this preacher's group were encouraged to think really radically about ultimately sacrificing their lives for the good of their community. He'd quote Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. This pastor used that verse to justify uh, controversial and aggressive stances towards his perceived enemies. And he thought, you know, after all, if Jesus said all these things and we need to be like Jesus, shouldn't we think the same way? We have to ask a question, what if this preacher was wrong? What if this pastor had misunderstood God's word? What if his applications of the biblical texts weren't what God intended? In 1978, the world found out that this preacher had gotten it all wrong. This preacher was Jim Jones, and the People's Temple Agricultural Project was better known as Jonestown. And on November 18th of that year, over 900 people drank cyanide-laced uh, Kool-Aid. Uh, 
and died. In total, 918 people were killed in this mass murder-suicide plot, and it was the greatest loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act until 9-11. Now, these two stories that I've just told you are, uh, they're rather extreme and horrendous evils, but what we need to understand from stories like this is that misunderstanding and misinterpreting God's word can have grave consequences. When we talk about the word of God, we are talking about things like supreme authority. We are talking about the creator and his creatures. We are talking about how the world is supposed to work. So when we grab hold of biblical texts, we need to be aware of the power that we are wielding. It means at the end of a day, in the, at the end of the day, in a little more mundane way that hits home, we need to be really careful about the verses that we put on our refrigerator magnets. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, that when we understand the Bible correctly, that we hold weapons for warfare that have divine power to destroy strongholds. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. There's a warning in this passage. It means that when you tell someone that you know, maybe it's another Christian, maybe it's a coworker or a friend or a family member, when you tell someone to live in a certain way from a biblical text, you are doing so with divine authority. And so we need to make sure that we are not misrepresenting God or abusing his authority. But in those verses, there's also a great hope. God has given you in his word all that you need to fight against sin, to know the truth, and to grow in holiness in his son, Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so in this class for the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of the most well-known Bible verses that are often taken out of context. And we're going to look at how we can correctly understand and apply them to our life. But tonight, before we dive into the nitty-gritty of properly interpreting some of those passages, uh, we need to see the dangers of misunderstanding the Bible. So why are there so many misunderstandings? I want to give you five reasons tonight why people tend to misunderstand or misinterpret the biblical text. And they move, starting with the first one down to the last one, they move from accidental to more uh, deliberate misinterpretations. So the further that we get down the list, the more and more we are responsible for our own application and interpretation of these Bible verses. So let's dive into that list. The first one is this. The Bible is hard to understand sometimes. It just is. The Bible has difficult texts within it. In 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter says this, "'Count the the patience of our Lord as salvation, "'just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you "'according to the wisdom given him, "'as he does in all his letters,' when he speaks in them of these matters. And here we go. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So from this passage, we can see a couple of things. First, Peter considers Paul's letters to have, uh, he says they have difficult things in them. You know, what are we supposed to do with passages like 1 Corinthians 11, 
where it talks about wearing head coverings in the church. What are we supposed to do to interpret 2 Thessalonians 2, where it talks about the man of lawlessness being unleashed? The Bible simply contains passages that are hard to grasp. It's just a brute fact. And God knows this, and he admitted it to us through Peter's letter, but God still chose to reveal himself to us in this way. And so the fault is not with God. The fault is ultimately with us. And so we need to work hard to dig into these passages like this and interpret them well. The second thing that we can see from this passage is that Peter points out that people use the scriptures, especially the hard ones, to cause trouble. If you don't understand a passage, chances are you're going to go and look for somebody else who does. Maybe it's a pastor, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe you're consulting a commentary or a study Bible. But in the moment that you put yourself in the place of a learner, you are entrusting yourself to that person's interpretation of the passage. And when you do that, you open yourself up to the potential for manipulation. The ignorant and the unstable, as Peter says, will twist the scriptures and seek to exploit you. People that do not love God will try to tell you what the Bible actually means. You can find these books all over the place in bookstores where there's people that sit around and they're not believers, they don't profess Jesus as Lord, and they will try and tell you and interpret the Bible to you, and they get it all wrong every time. And so uh, the first reason why there's many misunderstandings of the Bible out there is that God said it would be that way. Uh, The second reason why there's a lot of interpretations out there is because people are trying to exploit what's going on in the scriptures for their own gain. And look, on this side of heaven, No one is going to arrive at a perfect interpretation of Scripture. I don't have it all figured out. Pastor Tim doesn't have it all figured out. None of you have it all figured out. We just aren't going to know everything about the Bible on this side of heaven. We are finite and fallible creatures. But God uses our strivings to learn the Bible better and to grow in His Word to grow us in our holiness. The more that we do learn about the Bible, the more that we seek to apply it to our lives, the more we are going to grow to be like Jesus. And God has designed this process for his people. So the Bible is just hard to understand sometimes. A second reason why there's a lot of misunderstandings out there is there is a lack of of biblical literacy. There's a lack of biblical literacy. Biblical literacy just means uh, knowledge and familiarity with the Bible. It's stories, the narratives, the precepts and the concepts, uh, the purpose, and even just how to find things, knowing where books of the Bible are located and in which order they are in. And biblical literacy is... uh, declining in today's world. Biblical illiteracy is on the rise. A a LifeWay study from a couple of years ago found that only 36% of evangelical Protestants, so people like us who believe the gospel, who believe in Jesus as Lord, and believe that reading the Bible is important, and believe that the Bible is God's word, 36% of evangelical Protestants regularly say that they read the Bible personally every day, 36%. Albert Moeller, a great theologian, said, the scandal of biblical illiteracy is our problem today. The best way, if you find yourself being biblically illiterate, the best way to grow biblically literate is just to read the Bible and listen to it preached. Here's here's a secret that you might not know about uh, seminary. So you think that we send folks off to seminary to go sit in these classrooms and hear a lot of 
uh, really great teaching, which is true, but they actually don't teach you all that much beyond what you can learn about the Bible from just reading it over and over and over and over. And so the professors who are smart assign reading the Bible as part of their assignments. If you read the Bible over and over and over, hop on to our Bible reading plan uh, here that we're doing as a church and just immerse yourself daily in the scriptures and then read a few good Christian books to help you understand it, you're going to find yourself in a really biblically literate place. So pastors go off to seminary or guys go off to seminary in order to learn the Bible. And the Lord has actually provided his church with guides to help us understand the Bible better. Seminary is um, seminary is great. I don't want to totally uh, make it sound like it's pointless. Seminary is very helpful. But biblical literacy for the average everyday person, all you got to do is read the Bible and just keep reading it. But in Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, Paul says, Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue or stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. God is saying in this passage that he has given all of these different types of leaders to the church for the express purpose of helping the congregation grow in the knowledge of Jesus and becoming more mature in Christ likeness. Why do pastors exist? To help you know the Bible better. That's what this passage is saying. And one of the results of growing in your knowledge of the Bible is stability in your thinking and depth in your interpretation. The more biblically illiterate you are, the more susceptible you are to biblically irresponsible interpretation. The more that you are latching on to bad interpretations, the more you're going to find your life being chaotic. That's what this passage says. You're being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. God has told us how he has designed us and the best way to live in his word. And the world knows that you as a Christian want to submit yourself to what the Bible says. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you are a Christian and you're a believer, you will have a drive and a desire in you to submit yourself to God's word. And so this is where the scheme of the devil comes in. It's not to get you to believe obvious lies that come from other sources of authority. The devil knows that you're going to just reject things like that. When someone says like, oh yeah, well, the Buddha says, you're like, no, get that out of here. That's not in the Bible. But human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes will seek to twist the Bible and manipulate its authority over you to get you to do what the world wants. When the world comes at you and says, well, you know what? The Bible really says this. Then we as Christians sometimes perk up and say, oh, well, if it's what the Bible says, then you've got my attention. The danger of biblical illiteracy is that you can be carried away on the stormy seas of false doctrine and not even know it. Instead, the book of Acts gives us a glimpse of what good biblical students do. They search the scriptures to confirm any teaching that comes from the Bible. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. 
When is the last time on a Thursday afternoon that you picked up your Bible and still remembered the sermon from Sunday and sought to investigate what the pastor said? When a pastor gets up to preach, you should have your Bible open and your mind focused. Another reason why there's a lot of misunderstandings out there is that people value trust over truth. What do I mean by that? The third reason why there's numerous misunderstandings of the Bible is because people value their trust in their leaders over the truth of the Bible. If you have been a Christian for a while, or maybe if you just became a Christian recently, most likely some of the most important and influential people who are in your life or who have been in your life are the people who led you to the Lord and who have helped you to understand the Bible better. I think if you think right now about the people who have influenced you the most as a Christian, it's the people who have helped you understand God's word. You've watched them and how they took what they believed and they put it into practice as well. Hebrews 13, seven through nine says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So here the author of Hebrews is linking the teaching of God's word with the doing of God's word in the preacher's life. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to him. The author of Hebrews is saying that those whom you look up to as leaders need to, one, be people that teach you God's word, and two, that their life lines up with what they teach. And then as you see the way that the word of God affects their life for good, you should imitate that. You should do what they do. Grow in your understanding of the Bible. Do what the Bible says and then experience the blessings that are promised. And then look to your pastors and leaders as good examples of what that actually looks like. Paul charges Timothy, a young pastor, to live this kind of lifestyle. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Again, Timothy's character and preaching are tied together. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Paul uses a very uh, vivid word picture here to describe the spread of false teaching through the congregation. Gangrene is, I saw some pictures of it today as I was studying and was grossed out a little, uh, but it's a disease that starts in one part of the body and slowly spreads and kills the tissue. The infection of bad doctrine in Timothy's church was spreading from person to person, and it led to ungodliness among the people. Paul's antidote to this poison is for Timothy, the pastor, to do two things. Do you see what they are? It's to teach right and to live right. Timothy has to rightly handle the word of truth, and he has to properly interpret the Bible to his congregation. And in this passage, Paul warns Timothy about Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have started misinterpreting the Bible by saying that the final resurrection from the dead has already happened. And there were people that started listening to them. And as a result, 
those people's faith was falling apart because they were now believing lies that were built on a shaky foundation of a man-made doctrine. So people value the trust that they have in their leaders over the truth of the Bible sometimes. And when we do that, sometimes we are going to follow leaders who misinterpret the Bible to us. And so we have to be on our watch against false teachers, against false prophets. Another reason why people misunderstand the Bible is through plausible arguments. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Colossians chapter 2 verses 4, 8 and 23. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. These have indeed the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Paul says that there are those in this world who are really good at presenting plausible, logical, philosophical arguments. There are a lot of people out there who know how to put words together in a way to convince you that they are right. It is easy to get swept away by smart people. It is easy to get swept away, Paul here says, by mystical people, people that are claiming that they've got the secret to your uh, growth. If you just do these things that they and they alone have figured out, then you will grow uh, in your faith or in some other way. Whether it's one or the other, Paul warns us that they look correct, and maybe they could be helpful in how they look, but they're actually vacuous, unhelpful, and demonic in origin. They promise help and hope, but they actually just take up valuable time and resources that we could be using to fight sin. We don't want to be listening to the bad advice that demons give us. So how do we avoid doing that? Well, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Instead, our task, as John says, is not just to accept at face value everything that someone teaches, even if they're teaching it in the name of Jesus, even if they're claiming that what they're teaching is from the Bible. And one of the best ways that you can test the spirits is to do what Hebrews chapter 13 said earlier. Look at the lifestyle of the teacher. If their life lines up with the rest of what Scripture teaches, then you can feel more assured that their interpretation of a harder passage is probably correct. If their life and their teaching line up, it's a good indicator. But if their life and their teaching are disparate, don't listen to them. That's right. People also want their ears tickled. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through through 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who's to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That's what Timothy is supposed to do. Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This verse teaches us that some people misunderstand and misinterpret the Bible intentionally. They want to do it. They will listen to pastors and teachers who teach the Bible that they want to hear. They will listen to the pastor that they like, not the pastor that's necessarily preaching the truth. And maybe that might be you in this room. Even right now, 
Are you in this class more because you like the teacher or more because you want to know more about the subject? When one pastor starts delivering biblical truth that convicts folks like this, they split, they leave, they get out. They start looking for other sources of truth, different denominations, modern psychology, self-help books, social media, influencers, celebrities. They are like the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, verse 21. All the Athenians and foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They just want to hear something new. So these are five major reasons why misunderstanding about the Bible abounds. But why is that so dangerous? Why is it so dangerous to misinterpret the Bible? Prosperity gospel is one reason. I want to give you three on your sheet there. The first one is that our salvation depends upon understanding the Bible properly. Salvation, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, then we need to make sure that we are preaching the word of Christ to those who hear. And we need to make sure that we are hearing the word of Christ regularly. Anything else other than the word of Jesus Christ is a false gospel. In Galatians 1, 6, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Paul warns against the rise of false gospels in this passage. He says says in the next couple of verses, anyone who teaches and anyone who listens to a false gospel in the name of Jesus should be accursed. They should be cut off from God. And this should be a good impetus for us to preach the gospel even to ourselves every single day, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and his perfect life and death on the cross made a way for us to be forgiven for our sins. And that as he rose up from the dead, that we can now have eternal life when we repent of our sins and believe in the gospel. Anything other than that is a false gospel. If you're believing anything other than that for your salvation, you are not saved. And so we must make sure that we are preaching a true gospel, that we are preaching the word of God rightly, and that we are listening to people who are teaching us the Bible rightly as well. Misunderstanding the Bible is also dangerous because it can lead us into sin. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and Perfect. Understanding the Bible properly helps us to know what the will of God is. And the will of God involves us living rightly before God. Everything that God commands us to do is good and acceptable and perfect. And we must live our lives in accordance with God's words. word. Anything else is sin. So if we have a wrong view about what God's word says about a subject we can easily find ourselves committing sins that we didn't even know were sins. 2 Peter 3.17 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. The letter of 1 John says that sin is lawlessness. So when Peter says that we can get carried away in doctrinal error, and wind up being with lawless people, we're going to find ourselves in sin. And when we get wrapped up in error, we lose our stability, is what Peter says. Suddenly, these sweet truths of the Bible 
become bitter in our mouths. The goodness of God's comfort in trial will actually start leading us into frustration, and our own hearts begin to just shrivel up and wither and die when we wind up in sin. And the only remedy is to have our spirits transformed by the power of God's teaching. Good doctrine is a precious remedy against sin and suffering. We also need to make sure that we are growing in our sanctification. Misunderstanding the Bible stunts the growth of our sanctification. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is a classic passage that's used to defend the inerrancy of Scripture, but notice that Paul assumes inerrancy here. He's not making an argument for the inerrancy of Scripture. Instead, he shows that God's Word, because it is inerrant, leads to sanctification. There's a logical progression of these four words, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. God's Word provides us with the truth, the thing that must be taught and what we must learn. And when we are confronted with the truth, it reproves us. It shows us how our lives don't line up with God's law. And then it shows us how to correct the sinful practices that we are doing. And finally, it shows us how to straighten out our lives and live daily in righteous patterns. But notice that it all begins with teaching. It begins with a proper understanding of God's word. If we start off on the wrong foot or if we start off on the wrong angle, we're going to end up in the wrong place in the end. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. Peter says that God's word contains everything that we need to know in order to grow in holiness. God has not kept anything back from us that we need to know about how to live our lives for him. There is nothing in your life that the Bible doesn't have something to say about. But when we understand the Bible correctly, we can take its truth and apply it to each and every area of our lives. That's why it's in our mission statement as a church that we're reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. The danger is when we misinterpret the word. It suddenly becomes irrelevant, useless, or unhelpful. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 15. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, Beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this, He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letters. Notice in that passage that Paul ties sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth together. You can't have one without the other. You have to learn the word, and sanctification comes through your understanding of the word. Paul says that he taught the Thessalonians properly. He gave them the real gospel, that they heard Paul preach, and they have read his divinely inspired letters. And when they listen to that word, they can, as the passage says, obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that misunderstanding the Bible can be really, really dangerous. It leads us down rocky paths that will make shipwreck of our faith. But when we correctly understand the promises and stories and teachings in the word, we get to experience great blessings. Blessings that are even better than the bad interpretation that we used to have. We will have salvation in Jesus Christ. We can effectively and really fight against our sin and stop falling headlong into it. And we can grow in our holiness in the way that we live our lives. 
Listen, if you find yourself constantly struggling in your Christian growth or in your battle against a particular sin, it could honestly be because you have, not, you have misunderstood some of what God's word teaches about it. The problem isn't necessarily with your willpower and your desire to want to fight that sin harder. It could be that you're fighting it in the wrong way because you've misunderstood the Bible. So knowing now that misunderstanding the Bible is so dangerous to our spiritual health and that the Bible warns us over and over again about all the ways that we can fall into error, how are we supposed to arrive at the truth? How can we know whether or not we have understood the Bible properly. Well, as we close tonight, I want to give you uh, four quick ways to start thinking about uh, biblical passages. And we're going to use some of these categories to help us properly interpret the verses that we're going to start diving into throughout the rest of our class time together over the weeks. So the first one is this. The first guideline to set up as you seek to understand the Bible, is to know the context of the passage. There's a lot of things that have to deal with the context of the passage. This is where a lot of great study tools come in that can teach you things like how the grammar of the passage is constructed. Because, you know, there were, there were no uh, chapter and verse markings in the original manuscripts, right? They just wrote the books. Those were added later. And oftentimes what happens is those chapter and verse divisions create unhelpful divisions in our minds and even unhelpful divisions within the text of Scripture, and it separates thoughts from thoughts. We like to memorize one verse when the whole complete thought goes all the way through the next three verses. Or you think about Ephesians 1, uh, where it's like 14 verses is one sentence in the original language. And so we need to look for things like grammatical markings or bookends. Here's an example. In Luke chapter 9, verses 7 through 20, the story starts off with Herod, who asks who Jesus is. He says, uh, he's like, who's this Jesus guy? And his helpers come back and they say, well, some say he's John the Baptist. Some people say he's Elijah. Some people say he's one of the prophets. And then suddenly, it seems like the story shifts. And Jesus then feeds 5,000 people and performs that great miracle. And then right after that, it shifts again, and Jesus goes to his disciples and says, who do people say that I am? And they say, some people think you're Herod, or some people think you're John the Baptist, some people think you're Elijah, some people think that you're one of the prophets. And Jesus says, who do you say I am, Peter? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And those wordings there that the asking about who Jesus is, that he is he John the Baptist or a prophet or Elijah, those are bookends that Luke places in the text to help us know that this is kind of one story put together that you won't see if you're just looking at verse markers. And what you see is that Jesus confirms his deity, that he's not John the Baptist. He's not Elijah. He's not one of the prophets. He's greater than all of those guys because he performs a miracle that's incredible by feeding 5,000 people at one time. It's confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is and being the son of God. So we have to look for little markers like that in the text. We have to look for connecting words. Whenever you see a therefore, in the text, you should ask what the therefore is there for. That's right. We need to look and think about what is the flow and the main point in this text. What's the author really trying to communicate to us? Don't read Genesis chapter 3 about the fall and have your mind dwelling on the question, was that fruit citrusy or was it sweet? You've missed the point. Another helpful thing in understanding the context of the passage is to understand the geo-historical goings-on at the time. Where did this story take place? Who was in charge in the government? What was the culture like? How does this passage connect to previous passages in the Bible? How does history help us interpret this 
present text that we're reading? And how would the original readers have understood this text? We also need to look at things like the genre of the text. There's a lot of different genres out there. Uh, Discourse genres are things like the letters of Paul or speeches that are delivered in the text. There's narratives that tell stories. There's poetry that takes shape in prophecy and the wisdom literature and even the songs. And all of these different types of genres find themselves being interwoven through many of the books of the Bible. And if you read metaphorical language literalistically, you'll end up with some weird things. If you take a text that is supposed to be a metaphor and should be understood as a metaphor based off of its literary genre, and you say, no, I'm going to interpret this as someone just telling me a flat fact, well, then you're going to run into weird things where Jesus gets up in John and says, I am the door. And you're going to start thinking that your Savior is a piece of lumber. So we have to understand, what is, this, what is the type of writing that this author has written? We need to make sure we read each genre using the rules of that genre. We also need to think about the canon of Scripture. We need to understand how, when we're reading isolated passages of Scripture, how they fit into the context of the entire Bible. How does this verse get interpreted by other passages? The Bible interprets itself to us in so many places. One way that we ask this question, how do we see a grand fulfillment of this Old Testament verse in the New Testament? That's a simple way to start thinking about that context. There are other things called types. You may have heard of types. Types are patterns in the Scripture that find a greater fulfillment in latter portions of the Bible. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Or 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, as that typology language, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. There's nothing controversial in that passage. There's nothing misunderstood in that passage. But we can see that Paul and Peter take concepts from biblical history and show how they directly correlate to the New Testament, especially Jesus. Adam prefigured Jesus's incarnation. Jesus is the new and better Adam who never sinned. The flood prefigured baptism by immersion. Just as God washed away the sin of the world in the flood and Noah passed through that water in the ark, so baptism pictures sin in our hearts being washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. We also need to think about the church's consensus. And I know in a room full of Baptists that that can get a little scary for me to say. But we need to think about the church's consensus on passages. 1 Timothy 3.15. If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Paul says that the church holds up and seeks to guard the truth of God's word. It does not mean that there are no false churches out there. But it And it does not mean that the church is the final authority. The final authority is God's word. But it does mean that we shouldn't just outright reject all historical interpretations. God has preserved true interpretation of his word through his people down through the centuries. We need to be cautious about 
new interpretations of passages or new methods to understand the Bible. If you believe that you have discovered an insight about the Bible that no one else in the history of Christianity has ever found, you should assume that you are probably wrong. (laughs) At the end of the day, when you go back and look at all of the major creeds and confessions and catechisms and books that have been written about the Bible over the centuries, you will find a remarkable consensus about what the Bible teaches. So what this means is that any sort of like, well, it's just me and my Bible figuring it out, any sort of that mentality should be met with much skepticism. And one great way to grow in your understanding of God's Word is actually to read the works of great interpreters of Scripture in Christian history. And finally, the most important context as we seek to unpack difficult, misunderstood, and misinterpreted scriptures over the next few weeks is that we have to keep Christ at the center. Christ always has to be at the center of our interpretation. Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus is the whole Old Testament is what that's a reference to, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. At the end of the day, if you get up tomorrow morning and you read your Bible, no matter where you are in the Bible, whether you're reading in the Psalms, whether you're in Leviticus 17, whether you're in Ephesians 2, if you read your Bible tonight or tomorrow morning and you cannot see how that text connects directly to Jesus Christ, you have missed the point of the text. You need to keep reading. Keep reading it over and over. Keep searching. Keep studying. You must see Jesus in the text. Don't stop until you see Christ clearly. Jesus is the point of the scriptures. The Bible from top to bottom is about Jesus Christ. It's not really about you. It's helpful for you, but it's about Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us about our Savior in order to help us be like our Savior. So let's make sure that we interpret it properly so that we might look more like Jesus together. Let's pray. Father, even as I stand up here and talk about the importance of understanding texts correctly, and as we have read numerous passages from your word and sought to apply them even in our lesson tonight, Father, I am just aware of the gravity and the weight behind wielding your word. Lord, we pray that you would give us clarity that your Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and grant us wisdom and eyes to see the truth of your word. Father, we want to be faithful interpreters of the Bible. Help us to see your Son, whom the whole Bible is all about. And Father, as we go for the next few weeks and think about uh, tough passages, and uh, Father, even as... uh, we might even have our toes stepped on in the way that we have previously interpreted certain passages. Father, I pray that you would help us to see the bigger, grander, and more beautiful picture of how these passages really connect to Jesus Christ and glorify him. And as we look upon your son in your word, we pray that as we behold his face, that we would, like your word says, be transformed into one degree of glory to another as we seek to look like Jesus. Help us. We need you to give us your spirit to do all of this. And we ask that you would in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.